Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Sienna from Dragon Trail Interactive. Thank you very much for joining us today for today's webinar on European based Chinese travelers. We have a lot of really interesting data and insights to share about this important and often overlooked demographic, including students and professionals who are living in Europe. So we're very pleased to have you join us today. Today's agenda will be broken into five parts. Uh, we'll start the webinar by um, giving a brief introduction to the European-based Chinese market, why this demographic is so important, and some basic do's and don'ts. Next, we'll present some very insightful research by Wonderful Copenhagen into Chinese students studying in the UK and their travel behavior in Europe. Next, I'll hand over to my co-presenters for today's webinar, starting with Dragon Trail's Roy Graf, who will talk about a case study of a campaign that he did together with Eurostar, um, which really worked uh, together with the European-based Chinese community. Um, next, we have with us Berlin-based KOL Zhang Jin, who's going to talk about her own travel experience in Europe, as well as the um, travel writing that she does around that. And we'll finish up by talking about how European-based Chinese travelers uh, have been traveling in Europe already this summer. Uh, we, you are welcome to send in your questions for us at any time using the Q&A button, which you should see on your Zoom control panel. And we will answer the questions in a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, please do ask your questions by using the Q&A button uh, rather than the chat to make sure that we see the questions and we can answer them at the end. We also will be sharing with all participants a copy of today's slides as well as a link to a recording of the webinar. So you will have that tomorrow for your own reference and you're also very welcome to share it with colleagues who might be interested but weren't able to attend the live session today. So to introduce today's speakers, um, first, we're really pleased to have with us Zhang Jin, who is a Chinese travel KOL who's based in Germany. Uh, she is the founder of the award-winning online travel platform, Traveling Sisters. She has, um, Traveling Sisters has more than a million followers on WeChat and Weibo. She has also hosted several television shows and been widely covered in Chinese print media, radio, and television. And she's the author of a best-selling book on travel. Next, we have Roy Graf, who is Dragon Trail Interactive's Managing Director for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Roy has more than 25 years of experience in the Chinese tourism sector and prior to joining Dragon Trail, he founded his own marketing consultancy in London called China Contact. Uh, finally, there's me, uh, Sienna. I'm Dragon Trail's Associate Director of Communications, and I'm in charge of the company's educational resources, including the reports, articles, and videos that you'll find on the Dragon Trail website, our monthly uh, webinar series, and um, compiling market intelligence. I also want to thank two other really important contributors to today's webinar. The first is Kai Trip, um, also known as Kai Yuan in Chinese. This is one of your, Europe's largest and most well-known Chinese travel agencies. Um, and they are also a media brand that promotes shopping and travel to a Chinese audience uh, in Europe. They're headquartered in Germany and um, they have a very strong focus on the European-based Chinese market, as well as uh, incoming Chinese travelers. So uh, they have a lot of experience and very valuable insights uh, for today's webinar topic. They are also very open to cooperating and helping tourism brands and businesses in Europe with their um, outreach to Chinese living in Europe, as well as uh, Chinese in China and you are very welcome to get in touch with them directly, um, contacting Marin Hartung, who is their head of strategic corporate management. 
her email is on the screen here and you'll have it with uh, the presentation slides that we will send out if this is something that's interesting for you. I'd also like to thank wonderful Copenhagen, which is the tourism board for Denmark's capital region. They do a lot of very interesting and helpful market research and they even have a whole website that is dedicated to market research on the Chinese market. They were very kind to give us permission to share with you today some of the findings from their most recent survey that they did of Chinese students in the UK in 2019 that was published in March of this year. And you can also view and download this full report as well as many others on their website. Before we launch into today's webinar, I'd also like to say a few words about Dragon Trail Interactive for those of you who might be joining our webinars for the first time. Uh, Dragon Trail Interactive is an award-winning digital marketing agency that is focused on Chinese outbound tourism. The company was founded in 2009 in Beijing and now has offices throughout China, as well as in London, where Roy and I are based, and the US. We work with tourism brands and businesses around the world to help them to reach Chinese consumers as well as the Chinese travel trade through digital initiatives. We work with um, clients on every continent except Antarctica, and this includes a number of different industry verticals, including tourism boards, airlines, hotels, attractions, and more. Uh, so getting started with today's webinar, um, in 2018, there were more than 2 million um, overseas Chinese living in Europe. Now, obviously, this is not a totally homogenous demographic, uh, but there are some key essentials to help give a clearer picture um, of this group, especially in terms of its relevance to the tourism industry. So when we talk about Chinese living in Europe, there are a number of key groups for travel, and these are the groups that KaiTrip targets in um, their work with uh, the European-based market too. So the first of these is students. Um, at least before COVID, there were more than 120,000 Chinese university students in the UK more than 35,000 in Germany and more than 30,000 in France. So um, this is a, a huge group. Obviously, there are also many Chinese professionals, uh, young to middle-aged professionals who are living and working in Europe and may well have come over together with their families. Um, KaiTrip also works with Chinese businesses that are based in Europe as well as official institutions to provide travel services to their employees. So these European-based Chinese, they're not just important because they're uh, consumers or tourists. They're also um, can really be seen as influencers, as KOCs, key opinion consumers. And they can impact to a large extent um, the kinds of destinations and attractions that Chinese travelers in China know about in Europe and help to um, kind of uh, give more awareness of these destinations and attractions on online platforms and Chinese social media. They're also very likely to be receiving visitors from China and obviously have a big impact on uh, what these visitors do and where they go when they are in Europe. Just as an example of how influential Chinese in Europe can be on the tourism industry, uh, the website qyer.com, Chongyo, is one of China's biggest online travel platforms. And this was actually founded by Chinese students in Germany as a platform where they could meet uh, travel companions and share information about backpacking through Europe. Uh, as of 2019, this website now has 88 million users. So we talked to KaiTrip about how European-based Chinese might differ from Chinese outbound tourists and to identify some key do's and don'ts, especially uh, for the current situation. So as European residents, these are likely to be quite experienced travelers and to have strong European language skills. 
And this means that they could be especially sensitive to being perceived as um, just another Chinese tourist or a source of cash. Um, so it's really important to treat them as individuals. And particularly now when there's been a lot of anti chinese sentiment in the news or online regarding coronavirus or political issues and anti-Asian racism in Western countries, it's really important for the tourism and hospitality industries to um, be friendly and welcoming and help to um, kind of counteract some of those fears or um, even negative experiences that have happened in the past. Uh, it's also just very important to keep reiterating that Chinese are welcome as visitors. Um, obviously, without Chinese uh, tourists coming over from China and a lot of tourism businesses and brands having budgets uh, slashed at this point, um, some have gone quite quiet on social media and other marketing channels uh, in terms of the, the welcome that they have for Chinese visitors. And this is something that is noticed by the community here. So uh, make sure that they know that they are welcome. Um, it's also a good idea for both local Chinese and for future uh, visitors from China to be making available in Chinese any information about current um, travel regulations and restrictions as these can vary by country to country within Europe right now. And they're also changing quite frequently. So this can be something that is very confusing for those who are already in Europe and want to travel now. And making that information available also sends a strong message to Chinese in China um, to let them know kind of what you're doing and to give them confidence um, in uh, kind of organizational um, things and COVID-19 control measures. So the don'ts here are quite similar to the do's and um, I just want to be clear that the example here that I have from uh, Atout France's WeChat account is not a negative example, it's actually a positive example to show that this tourism board has been active um, over the summer here and the kind of content that they have been sharing has been very relevant for Chinese who might already be in Europe and traveling in France. So for instance, they published an article on outdoor eating and drinking venues in Paris and they've also published an article on small towns to visit in France. And this really matches up with um, the kind of travel that is popular right now. So it's just important uh, in terms of don'ts to not go silent in your communications um, and also not forget about making information available in Chinese as, um, as we'll see, um, even though European based Chinese uh, will probably have quite strong English or other European language skills, uh, they still often prefer to do their research and find information in Chinese and using Chinese online platforms. So these are the same platforms that you're using to reach the outbound market. So let's talk about one core group of Chinese in Europe, students. Uh, there is of course some uncertainty about when students might be coming back to Europe if they left before or during the lockdown period uh, here in Europe. Uh, however, there are other students who haven't left, others that will be coming back soon, and in the long run, this is still uh, a key group to look at uh, that can really benefit you. So one example of that is the Edinburgh Tourism Board. They really do a fantastic job connecting to the local Chinese university student community. And then these students and alumni later on uh, are very supportive of the city's tourism marketing efforts. So this includes contributing user-generated content that can be used by the tourism board for their Chinese marketing, as well as giving a lot of positive feedback and interaction with their social media posts. So to look at this group more scientifically, um, in 2019, Wonderful Copenhagen surveyed uh, 547 Chinese students who were living in the UK about their travel uh, plans and behavior in Europe. Um, and they published the results in March of this year. 
they found that 60% of Chinese students in the UK were visited either by friends, family, or both from China during their studies. They also found that the vast majority of Chinese students in the UK were traveling um, in the UK as well as to Europe um, during the time of their studies, that they tended to travel quite often, and that their average trip length was more than six days. So we're talking about much more than just day trips and weekend getaways here. In terms of where the students traveled, um, we can see that Paris was the clear front runner, uh, followed by Rome, Venice, Amsterdam, and Barcelona. And don't forget that we will be sharing today's slides with you, so you'll have all of this information to refer to tomorrow, and you can also download um, and view the full report on the wonderful Copenhagen website, which I shared earlier, um, and that is available for free. Uh, it should not be surprising that university holidays were the most popular times of year to travel. And this creates a great opportunity for destinations and attractions that want to attract visitors during the off season in December, as well as the spring shoulder season. Uh, they also found that Chinese students uh, tended to travel in small groups of friends and to travel independently. Um, so again, this is good for destinations that are looking to attract uh, smaller uh, groups of independent travelers rather than those traditional big coach tours. Uh, food and culture were the most important priorities for Chinese students when they chose their travel destination in Europe. And this actually lines up uh, pretty much exactly with sentiment that we see from the Chinese outbound market. So it's good news for your marketing content uh, that you can be focusing on the same things that will be appealing to both groups. Travel, um, method of travel is also important. About half of the students surveyed said that the method of travel, so whether a destination is available, um, um, you can get there by train or plane, uh, is something that affected their decision. And this might be one of the reasons that we see Paris uh, so far ahead of other destinations, is that Paris is a city that is easily accessible from the UK by train. Uh, this is actually the finding from wonderful Copenhagen survey that I found to be the most interesting and which relates to digital marketing. So we know that when marketing to Chinese in China, it's important to use uh, Chinese channels uh, because things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, etc., are all blocked in China. But what about Chinese students studying in the UK where there is no great firewall on the internet? Uh, it turns out that they still prefer to use those Chinese channels. Um, so Weibo, Mafangwo, WeChat, and Dianping all led the way as sources for information for planning travel. And of course, these are the kinds of platforms that the students will be familiar with using. They're in Chinese, which is very important. They're the same channels that are being used by these students, friends, and family back home. And I think there's also something to be said for getting travel information and tips from other Chinese travelers who might have um, a similar cultural background as well as similar travel priorities. Again, here on the right, we can see that Chinese travel websites, Chongyo and Mafangwo, um, were the most important sources of information for choosing a destination to travel to, followed by personal interests. Um, another finding from the study is that travel bookings were generally made within two months of travel. So please do check out wonderful Copenhagen's uh, Trinavia website uh, for all of the findings from this report, as well as other reports that they've published um, over the past several years about the Chinese market. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Roy to share a case study um, from Eurostar that really engaged Chinese living in Europe. Thank you, Sienna. Uh, and welcome everybody. It's really great to be here with you. Um, this uh, campaign is already quite a few years back, um, but I think it illustrates the way in which it's possible to target 
Chinese in Europe and how effective it can be. Um, so if we uh, go to the next slide. The uh, primary motivation was that uh, Eurostar wanted to uh, start basically um, checking up, see, uh, basic, you know, experimenting with the Chinese market without committing to a fully localizing the website and spending a lot of money on marketing in China. So they have a limited budget. They didn't want to make any uh, big systematic changes to their systems. Um, and they wanted, I think, to just uh, prove that it's possible to get the Chinese market to book more directly uh, with Eurostar. So the way we approach this is uh, uh, when they came to us uh, for the campaign, is to look at uh, user-generated content powering a competition-style campaign that will get people involved and also uh, would uh, get the Chinese people who are living, working, or studying in Europe to invite their network of friends and family back in China to participate and to engage with the campaign. So it took place between the end of 2014 and uh, around up to the middle of 2015. Uh, the campaign, the full campaign um, overall was around six months. Um, the main parts uh, took place between September and February. Now, uh, we started with an uh, invitation for people, anybody, to upload a short video um, about their favorite places in Europe and something to do with the European kind of uh, attractions or European life. They didn't have to necessarily live, uh, be based in Europe, but uh, it was, uh, the invitation was focused on people who could show, show their favorite places in Europe. So uh, naturally, it mainly focused on people who were already in Europe at the time. We used, um, we used uh, um, short video apps that share, could share into Weibo, and we used um, Weibo hashtags in order to um, bring it all together and create um, a mini site for the campaign that tracked all the hashtag um, linked posts. And then through the competition, there was an opportunity to vote, to invite your friends to vote for your video. Uh, that way we got more kind of viral sharing. And at the end, we narrowed it down to a short list. And then the, the 10 finalists were given the opportunity to film a professional um, shot, a professionally shot uh, short video with a team that you're a star basically paid for, a professional team um, of videographers. It was directed by the um, people uh, that uh, won. And out of those uh, 10 that were then basically shared again, and there was another public competition to vote for the finalists, the final uh, winning video was selected through uh, a panel of judges. And the winners basically, um, we, we, they, they chose, uh, two winners, one from Paris, one from London, with the um, prize being a full day, 24 hours in either Paris or London, including a Eurostar trip. Um, and that covered overnight, uh, business class Eurostar, return travel, and then uh, an all expense plate, uh, a sightseeing tour, as well as um, uh, free shopping with a, a budget to go shopping in a department store in uh, London or Paris. And um, basically, the way that we, we did that is uh, by engaging partners, including uh, Galerie Lafayette in Paris and um, uh, the New Western Company and, uh, uh, in, in, in London to basically provide credit uh, for shopping, as well as hotel partners and sightseeing tour partners. Now, um, all of these, uh, this actual um, trips in Paris and London were then professionally photographed as a documentary style. So there was a lot of content available to then create different lengths of videos that was widely shared on social media. And the winners also got a, um, a DVD of their trip as a souvenir uh, to take back with them and to share with their friends. Um, now, uh, overall, the campaign was quite successful considering it was one, I think, probably the first one of its kind to focus on uh, Chinese in Europe. Um, there were over 30, 70 million impressions on Weibo, uh, page impressions. It got coverage in Chinese media, specifically focusing on Chinese journals uh, and uh, Chinese newspapers based in Europe. Um, and it was also uh, quite uh, high up in the results. It was basically the top search results for, uh, on Baidu, the um, Chinese search engine, um, when people search for Eurostar. So the, uh, I think this is the last slide, right? Yeah. yeah. 
uh, yeah. So uh, now the what was interesting is that in order to get this campaign, we first did some uh, market research, which invited Chinese students and young professionals in Paris and Europe uh, to roundtable discussions. We sat with them and and basically queried what how they travel, what they like, what they don't like, the way that you know what they respond to in terms of incentives. We also ran some uh, quantitative studies online, um, partnering with. Um, influencers, so online influencers that were based in Europe and had a large following of uh, Chinese in Europe uh, to get as well, um, to get the survey, online survey with answers and that correlated with what we found in the focus groups. So uh, this campaign was built, you know, very much informed by uh, the findings of the study. So um, that's basically the introduction of the campaign and I'll be around for the Q&A to answer any questions you have on this or any other topic. Thanks. Thank you so much, Roy. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce a Chinese influencer, um, professional Chinese traveler based in Berlin, Zhang Jin. Hello, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Zhang Jin, the co-founder of Traveling Sisters. Now I'm living in Berlin, Germany. So first of all, it's my honor to be uh, invited to present here as a Chinese blogger who's living in Europe now, especially during the coronavirus period, which is, I think, the darkest hours for everyone. Many thanks to Dragon Trail to organize such a very practical and meaningful online sharing. Uh, and first of all, um, please allow me to introduce a little bit more about Traveling Sisters. The Traveling Sisters in Chinese, Bao Zou Jie Mei Hua, was established uh, five years before by me and my business partner, Pang Qianyi. Uh, we have focused on pro uh, providing real and up-to-date traveling information tips for more than one million followers on WeChat official accounts, Weibo, and many like news platforms. And uh, uh, we also have radio shows, uh, which is also called uh, Traveling Sisters, has is um, inspired 20 million audience, not only in China mainland, but also in Macau and Hong Kong uh, region. And um, we also produce videos and we write book and magazine columns as well. Anyway, we do everything we can do. So the end of last year, I moved to Berlin. And then when I finally settled down and was super excited to, oh, I, uh, I'd love to explore the whole Europe and boom, the pandemic just broke out. So when we are talking about the tourism, the tourism industry now, actually we are talking about the tourism in the post epidemic era, at least in the next like two years, three years, or we don't know how long, right? Um, so I'd love to call the phrase taken from a famous um, opening uh, paragraph of Charles Dickens novel. It was the best of time and uh, it was the worst of time. I think for a second half, everyone has very deep feeling because the tourism industry is among the, the sectors most affected by the coronavirus and uh, um, it's said to have its largest economic fallout out in history. So for example, like August should be the very, very high season for the whole tour tourism industry, right? because um, it's a summer holiday, summer vacation for all of the kids in university, in kindergarten, uh, in school. And we should have a lot of like the group, like the overseas study group, like two weeks in Cambridge or one month in Berlin music, Shula, something like that. Or we will have a lot, a lot of like family travelers from China mainland, but now we have nothing, right? Of course, for the travelers, now the big concern is, is the destinations really safe? Because like a um, few years ago, uh, I have um, like a comment from my follower, which I uh, paste on a slide. He said, okay, I have to say something because um, even it's not good, but I have to speak, speak it out. In the next two or three years, I don't, I dare not to travel abroad. So actually, I don't blame him. And I believe he's not the only one in China who has a 
fear about the travel related risk. What would you think if you read the headlines like this every day? Like, okay, coronavirus 19, German reports highest number of new cases, and um, Spain, Spain has more cases, something like that. So I think it's reasonable that the travelers feel unsafe. So the recovery of the whole tourism industry will be very slow and long. Very sorry, but we have to admit that and we have to face that. But next slide, it still could be the best of time. Why? Because opportunity always come with challenges. So for, for example, the pandemic is likely to speed up the pace of a digitalization. I was super upset like every day when I just moved to, to Berlin because as a Chinese, I get used to like cashless payment or something. I couldn't find my wallet anymore. I, I, I haven't seen the cash for years already. But in Berlin, in Germany, you have to bring your cash, your credit card, even they cannot use credit card. So basically you have to bring your cash with you forever, all of the time. But thanks for the coronavirus. No, I couldn't say thanks. But because of, a thank, uh, because of a, a coronavirus, we have more like cashless payments because we have like no touch rules, no touch policy. So we have more online shops or something. One of my best friends, he's working uh, in a super big mall like Cadave, something like Cadave Lafayette in Vienna and uh, um, he's working in the marketing department and he said finally we have online shop because of a coronavirus I said what you haven't had the online shop before because for me it's like that's impossible right so because of um, um, because of um, uh, coronavirus we are we speed up the um, digitalization uh, which is super convenient for the travelers, not only the travelers in China, but um, the travelers, the Chinese travelers in Europe as well. And uh, at the same time, live stream shopping becomes a latest trend in China. It helps a lot of business survive the pandemic because we don't have guests in our shop. And what can we do? Use the stream live stream shopping shop. During the lockdown in China, Traveler Sisters, we, we were uh, invited um, uh, by Sea Trip, which is a super one of the largest OTA in China. We make two live stream um, selling performance or something like that. And we got like um, 10 million RMB. We sell the hotel rooms and we got like 10 million RMB. So that is a very good, um, the very good results, I have to say, and the tourists, the German tourists aboard, tourist board, they have an online competition to find the live stream, uh, streaming hosts among the Chinese living in Germany. So before the Chinese could really travel to Europe in person, the Chinese travelers, they can enjoy cloud trip. We call it Yunlüxing, cloud trip. Um, and what we can do is we can um, diver diversify the market and sharpen market research to identify the strong segments likely to recover first, for example, for the uh, tourism industry in Europe, definitely the Chinese travelers um, based on uh, Europe, right, living in Europe, okay. Uh, and uh, what's more, in order to increase customers' confidence and ease travelers' fears about travel-related risk, what can we do? Can we uh, cooperate with the global health experts to work together to develop industry guides, guidance, guidelines, which might change the modern tourism industry forever? Can, can, can we, like... Um, the tourist uh, shakeholder in Europe. Can we do that first? And um, um, if you are ready, if the destinations are ready, please use social media effectively and to tell all of the customers, to tell the whole world, hey, we're doing 
whatever we can do to make the destinations, to make our group, our tour safe. And I have something to, to, to share. I got an invitation from Turkish Tourist Board last week. That is the first invitation I got after the, um, the virus um, outbreak. And what I wanna say is the theme of the fan tour it's very, very interesting because it's about, okay, ask the bloggers, KOL, to experience a safe travel during the coronavirus time in Turkey and interview the related people, for example, the doctors and nurses, the tourist stakeholders, or the health experts, and uh, to tell the audience, to tell the, um, our followers, Hey, that is my experience to travel in Turkey. And uh, all is good, all is okay. And uh, I'm still healthy when I come back to my own country, something like that. I think that is a brilliant and very uh, inspi inspiring, inspiring idea. So could we do that together? And um, what's more? Should I stop promoting in China because we don't have any uh, tourists uh, from China mainland now. I think that everyone knows that the answer is definitely no, because China is a very, very huge potential market. I want to share um, um, a data. Um, according to a survey from the end of last year, only one-tenth of Chinese have passport. Only one-tenth of Chinese had traveled abroad before. And what's the number of one-tenth of um, population. The number is 140 million. So we still have 1 billion market, Chinese market to explore. Can you imagine how huge it is? And what's more, we still have a large number of Chinese students or Chinese like me living or studying or working in Europe. So when you find your target, when you find your market, the second question comes out is how to get access to Chinese travelers. Next slide, Peter. Okay, the first of all is, oh, okay, the, uh, the three picture is what um, the Chinese tour, tourism industry um, have done during the lockdown period. For example, a lot of like airlines, they have like super, super um, reasonable price, like flight ticket package. And the second picture is a Chongyou, um, which um, Sienna mentioned before. And, um, and they organize a lot of bloggers like us, invite us to uh, make uh, the post to encourage the Chinese travelers. And the third one was a um, uh, post we we work with the uh, C-Trip uh, for the live streaming show. And uh, the guy in the middle, that is the CEO of C-Trip. Okay, and um, um, the next slide, I want to say, as Sienna mentioned before, even for the Chinese already living in Europe for so many years, but they are still using the Chinese platforms. Um, I think everyone knows that we have different like um, social media platforms like we don't use Instagram, Facebook that much, Twitter that much or YouTube that much. We have like WeChat, Weibo and for the um, um, tour, tourist platform we have Chongyou and Ma Feng Wu and um, um, in a survey uh, which uh, Sienna just shared most of Chinese, they are still using the Chinese social media to find them the travel advice and to help them to make the travel decision. Why? Because the majority users determine the content and um, the cultural difference really exists. So for example, when we are making um, the travel decisions, like where to visit, where to eat, which hotel to stay and which restaurant to go, we have different decisions um, because we are from different ba uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't discuss if, if it, that is good or bad. They just 
they are just different. For example, I have opened the TripAdvisor in Guangzhou once. So Guangzhou is the city I um, I lived before. I have lived there for like 18 years. And because I'm super curious about the TripAdvisor recommendations, so I found the five restaurants from the top 10 list are Western restaurants. Can you imagine that? I'm from the city with a lot of good cuisine. Even in China, we have the saying, if you want to eat something good, you just go to Guangzhou, go to my city. But on the list of TripAdvisor, the five of the best 10 are like Turkish, like Greek, steakhouse, beer garden, German beer garden. Why? Because who left the comments, the reviews? They are Westerners. For example, another example. I had a graveyard tour at midnight last year in Canada, which is super, super good for me. Uh, it's super, uh, that was super exciting. But is that very, is that suitable for every Chinese? For example, for my parents' generation or for my grandparents' generation, even that is the first recommended um, activity in that small village. The answer is no, because for Chinese, for um, especially for the older generation, the graveyards means unlucky. It bring you bad luck. It bring you death. Something like that. So if I tell my mom if i invite my mom say hey let's have a graveyard tour together i'm pretty sure my mom will roll her eyes to me definitely so the recommendation from chinese seems to uh, to be more safer for chinese travelers and my, what's more most Chi most chinese travelers we still need the strong strong sense of security in trip so like in instagram just use one picture and few tags. Can it help me? I have a question mark here. Of course, if the picture is so good, it's about the, the beautiful landscape and I might go there, but what do I do next? I go back to the Chinese social media platform to find more detailed information about that. So like the, uh, the, um, the articles we post on our WeChat, um, official account or on Ma Feng Wo uh, or on Chong Yu. It's very detailed, long articles. We even wrote like 20,000 words for one city. Can you imagine that? 20,000 words. That is already a, a thin book already because we want to tell our audience, our followers, everything like how to buy tickets how to get your visa, even what is the link of, um, um, of a foreign um, amb embassy, the link, the link you can apply for your visa, something like that, and what to order in a specific restaurant, and how to get a zona in the hotels. It's kind of like hands-on teaching. So if you just post some pictures on Instagram or something, it couldn't help okay and um what's more um now on the on the slide that is um the platform we post our articles so can you can you see it's that is a lot like like dozens of platforms platforms we are using in china to post our articles our uh information uh, travel information um to share our uh, tips or, or uh, information. And uh, so the next question is, how to satisfy the needs of Europe-based Chinese travelers? Because we travel a lot, we are very skillful travelers and we live in Europe already for long. So maybe we already visited like a Paris for five times. How can you attract me to Paris again? So the first thing I think we need, we always need fresh stimulation. So don't stop to explore, ex to explore something new. Um, for example, I, I was in um, Girona, which is a small 
Spanish city like two years before because that is very small. I stayed there for like three days. It's already enough for a, for a small city. But I visited there again. Why? Because I heard that, okay, the Game of Thrones uh, was shot there last year. So that is something new for me. For example, I was in Madrid in a um, football game and to watch a real Madrid and with some, something else or with some uh, another team. And if you ask me, okay, let's go to Madrid again to see the football match. I might refuse, but if you tell me, hey, you know what? After the uh, football match, we can have a, um, have a meeting with the football players. I will definitely go there. So even for the destinations, it's already very, very well known. Just find something new. That's always helpful. And uh, for the new destinations, the new destinations I mean here is um, those cities, those destinations, not like Paris, Barcelona, Rome, Berlin, but the small but beautiful places. We have a lot of places, places like that in Europe with very rich uh, history, culture, and, and um, blah, 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 whatever. And uh, how to make the Chinese travelers, not only um, in China mainland, but also in Europe, know about us? That's a question, right? But first of all, you have to use the right platform, social platform. And uh, the second is to find the right angle to promote your own destinations or your business, your tour, your routes, your group, something like that. For example, I give, um, give you some ideas. Do you have like historical stories or characters which the Chinese are familiar with? Like maybe Goethe uh, have stayed there for like two nights or the Queen Elizabeth uh, was there before, something like that. And uh, maybe you have very special festival. Like um, if I go somewhere, for the first time and I, I know about, okay, there's a um, very interesting festival. Okay, I will remember the time, okay, in, in, in June or something, and I will go there again for the next June or something, just for the festival. And I know there's a small village in, in Germany. They have very lovely um, festival. They celebrate the Chinese New Year. So for the festival, uh, all of the uh, citizens, they just costume and they wear the Chinese traditional ancient costume and have a parade, which is very good, especially for the Chinese um, travelers, right? Even I'm already here in Berlin, in Germany, I'd love to go there just for the, 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 the Chinese festival, the Chinese festival celebrated by the German people, which is very interesting. And um, or maybe you have very good wine and cuisine. I was in uh, Canada last year in New Scotia and they have very, very good lobster. You know, Chinese people like Boston lobster. We always say, oh, I'd love to have a Boston lobster. And when I was, was there and I knew that most of the Boston lobster, they are not from Boston, they are from Canada. So now um, the traveling sisters, we are working with um, a tourist board of uh, New Scotia to promote the uh, lobster trail in China. I'm pretty sure, I believe that, that is a very good selling point for Chinese travelers. Or maybe there is a um, best for one activity which the other places don't have. For example, I was in uh, Australia in Fraser Island, which is an um, island not far away from Brisbane and Co Gold Coast. It's just like two hours by car. And then when I was there, and that is not very well known for the Chinese travelers, I have to say that. And I found they have a, the best activity in every August, because you know, every August for like one or two months, there are like more than 1,000 humpback well mother with kids just stay in the lagoon and you 
and that is 100% percentage, 100% guarantee you can see the uh, humpback whales. And you can even swim with them. When I tell my friends and say, no, why I spend like 30,000 to go to Tango, Tango, Tanga, Tanga? No, a, a country in, a, in the South um, Pacific. Okay, well, I, went, I, I go there, I spend more money, I fly longer, and it's, that is even not like guarantee you can, you can see the humpback well, and we can just fly to Brisbane. It's just like eight hours from my country, from my city. And we're, and we're already there, and the, um, the payment is super reasonable. The price is super reasonable. If you have that, and uh, believe me, that is a very, very good selling point for Chinese travelers. And what's more, we need very, um, okay, <laughs> okay, Sienna. And we need very um, professional service, like uh, most of, um, uh, the Chinese based on Europe, we are like uh, FIT. And it's sad to say we, it's impossible for us to join um, a little a group. That is no, because like me, I always um, join in uh, the city tour in every city, in every city, because I'm new there. So there must be someone who can tell me more about the history, about the story. I'd love to join them. Or if I travel to Iceland and I'm super bad and I want to see the green light and I'm a super bad at driving on the icy roads and I have zero experience where to go to see the, um, the green light. Okay. And then definitely I take part in, I join in a local group tour. Okay. Um, actually I still have a lot of to share, but because our time is limited, so um today th that's it and um, i'm looking for um your questions and i'd love to to answer all of the questions um according to my experience or my understanding okay uh alice good cheers Thank you so much, Jean, uh, for sharing your experience as both a traveler and a travel blogger. I'm sure people will have questions uh, for you in the Q&A and also uh, might want to get in touch with you directly afterwards, in which case I can help to make that connection. Uh, so it's helpful to hear about your experience as a traveler. Um, I also want to supplement this with some information that was shared by Kytrip about what they've observed in the uh, Europe-based China market this summer. So starting right around the time that lockdown started to be lifted in Europe in early June, KaiTrip started to take bookings from their uh, Chinese clientele who are based in Europe. And they are under the impression that they have is that there's still a sizable group of Chinese based in Europe who are not comfortable traveling. Um, this group is especially concerned that if they travel, it will make them look reckless to friends and family back in China, and that it will especially make them look really bad if they catch the coronavirus. So they're staying where they are and being quite cautious. Um, but on the other hand, uh, KaiTrip also has a sizable um, portion of their clientele that is ready to get out and travel again, especially in Germany and in France. We see the same rise in demand for self-driving travel that we've seen in China's domestic market is definitely evident in the European market for Chinese tourists too where right now Chinese travelers are a bit wary of taking trains because of safety worries and uh, self-driving packages have gone way up. Um, these travelers are going as FITs or in small private tour packages. Uh, this is 
um, partly because big group tours aren't running right now. Uh, Kytrip thinks that the earliest these might come back are in the autumn of this year. And they noted that actually um, when the coronavirus crisis started first from China and then in Europe, a lot of European-based Chinese tour guides went back to China. And those who have stayed in Europe are trying to do um, anything they can to stay active and make money. So this can include Daigo uh, cross-border uh, commerce as well as live streaming. Uh, one more thing that KaiTrip has um, noticed with their clientele this summer that is quite interesting is that of the group that is traveling, they're staying very local. Um, they're visiting smaller destinations and they are mostly doing domestic travel, so staying within the country where they already live. Uh, KaiTrip was able to help us to conduct a small survey of their European-based clientele last week. Uh, there are only 39 respondents. We want to be clear about that. So it, this is not a scientific study. Um, obviously, there are a lot fewer respondents than uh, with the wonderful Copenhagen um, survey. But there are still some interesting results that I wanted to share. So with the question, have you traveled since lockdown restrictions ended? Um, the results from that are really in line with what KaiTrip has observed uh, in terms of their business and clientele this summer, where around half of their uh, clientele is not yet comfortable traveling, and then among those that are traveling, they're largely staying within the country where they already live. But looking ahead for travel plans for the rest of 2020, uh, we see increased intention to travel and especially traveling further. So traveling uh, more within Europe and outside of just uh, the country uh, where the um, survey respondent is a resident. We also asked a question about transportation and here we can really see uh, the clear preference for self-driving travel with um, almost 72% of respondents saying that self-driving is the way that they would prefer to travel around Europe right now, compared to only around 18% choosing train and 10% choosing flights. We also asked a question about where these travelers find their travel information. And the results here are a bit different from those that we saw from Wonderful Copenhagen, particularly in terms of Weibo, which was at the top of the list for Wonderful Copenhagen, and it's near the bottom here. And um, this could be affected by a number of factors. I mean, obviously, we have a very small sample size here, uh, as well as probably um, uh, an older demographic than the students who are responding to uh, KaiTrip survey. However, uh, with these responses, as well, we still do see that Chinese online platforms um, are used more often than Western social media. Since KaiTrip has so much experience working with Chinese travelers who are based in Europe, it's very helpful to see how they communicate with this group, um, to see how you can reach them too. So, they have a WeChat official account, um, as well as a WeChat mini program. On the picture on the right here, you can see an article that they published this summer um, on WeChat about weekend trips in German, uh, not in Germany, or in Europe in general. So that is obviously targeting a European-based market. Um, they also run uh, a few Weibo accounts. The one you can see here on the left is their kind of core company Weibo account, but they also have regional Weibo accounts. So they have a Caillou and Germany Weibo account. They also publish a magazine about travel in Chinese. But specifically, uh, one of the important channels that they use to communicate with the expat Chinese market in Europe is through private WeChat groups. So these are built up using personal networks and over time. So for instance, they might have um, a private WeChat chat, which can go up to uh, 500 people that is based on students from a certain university or an alumni group, uh, perhaps a private chat for a specific company or a chat group that is formed of members who attended the same offline event. So these are all the channels they use. Um, KaiTrip is very keen to 
help other tourism brands and businesses, uh, especially at this time. So um, particularly if you're a tourism board and you have a kind of a message, uh, official welcoming message for Chinese visitors, uh, this is something that they are very happy to help to amplify using their own uh, social media channels. So do get in touch with them if that's something uh, that you would like to do. Obviously, COVID-19 has changed uh, tourism marketing for Chinese and live streaming is the biggest way in which it's changed. Um, we've talked a lot about the rise of live streaming for tourism marketing. Uh, Jean shared earlier on and in um, earlier webinars this summer. So uh, Kaiyuan has its own live streaming channel um, on the Mafang Wu live streaming platform, and they have been using that this summer specifically to promote traveling in Northern Europe, particularly Denmark. They've done city tours in Copenhagen, as well as uh, a cooking class at the world famous restaurant Noma. Um, Jin also talked about e-commerce and live streaming shopping. And this is another thing that Kaiyuan has gotten into. They work with many different European brands uh, and they have been using the Chinese platform Kin Duo Duo to do some live streaming uh, for e-commerce. And this e-commerce hasn't just been cross-border e-commerce from Europe to China. It's also been for Chinese who are living in Europe, but at this point who would prefer to avoid going to shops or to city centers. And so they're buying online instead. Um, they even did, Caillou and they did um, cooperation with the piano brand Steinway to help them to promote a live streaming of a piano concert. Um, and this is another area where they are quite keen to help brands and uh, destinations in Europe to amplify their live streaming. So if you're doing uh, an activity like that, you can get in touch with them uh, to get some more publicity and hopefully some more uh, Chinese watching the live stream, uh, both within Europe uh, and back in China. So um, at some point we have faith that this crisis will pass uh, Chinese living in Europe will feel safe crossing borders again, and Chinese will be traveling from China to Europe. So the question is, what can you do to prepare for that? Uh, in terms of timing, probably the next big travel season for the Chinese outbound market is going to be Chinese New Year 2021. Uh, but for Chinese uh, students and professionals who are living in Europe, uh, traveling may well happen much earlier than that. Um, so how do you get ready for that? Um, marketing aside, uh, in terms of product development, I think it's really important to think about some of the trends that we're seeing now. So self-driving, traveling with smaller groups, uh, getting off the beaten track, maybe more local travel, um, all of those kinds of things can help you to put together um, products to suit the market. Um, in terms of marketing, of course, it's very uh, important, as I've said a few times in this webinar, to put out a strong message of welcome. Um, but on top of welcoming, uh, it's also important to inform people as to what's going on by publishing the latest news and regulations, as this can help those who are traveling now and also give confidence um, in the market who might travel later. So a couple of examples of that. Here, there's um, a Weibo post from Kaiyuan's uh, Germany account where they talk about um, infection numbers following in Germany. This was earlier in the summer and uh, some of the measures that have been put in place, including mandatory face masks on public transportation. Uh, another good example is from Switzerland tourism uh, this August. So this August, the uh, flights were relaunched between China and Zurich and the Swiss Tourism Board followed up on this by publishing a very welcoming and informative article about uh, the Zurich airport and social distancing measures and safety protocols that were putting, being put into place in the airport. Uh, so this helps those who are taking those flights now and it also makes people kind of confident in um, Switzerland and the Zurich airport's uh, commitment to COVID-19 prevention for the future. So that wraps up the presentation for today and we're almost ready for the Q&A session. Um, before we get into that, I just wanted to let you know very quickly about a few additional resources that we have 
and our next webinar. Um, so earlier this summer, we launched the Chinese Tourism Podcast, which is a monthly podcast that looks at the biggest news in Chinese tourism. We also invite guest speakers to come and participate in a deep dive discussion every episode. And in the August episode, um, uh, which is episode three, uh, we were joined by Veli Paulat from the Lufthansa Group uh, to talk about the aviation industry and also the experience of the Lufthansa Group this summer in relaunching flights uh, between China and Europe. And uh, that's available on uh, through the Dragon Trail website and the links here. We hope that you will be available to join us in three weeks for our next webinar. Uh, we'll be doing that together with media brand Jing Travel, looking at China's domestic tourism recovery and the kinds of lessons that travel destinations and businesses outside of uh, China can learn from that. Uh, meanwhile, if you're looking for more information, including reports, videos, um, interviews, weekly WeChat, and Weibo rankings, you can find those all on our website, dragontrail.com. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter and follow us on social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, um, as well as WeChat for um, daily updates on Chinese tourism and kind of upcoming events. So thank you so much to everyone for joining today. And please do send in any questions that you have using the Q&A button on your Zoom control panel.